What up world, it's Fess with Reverb. I've been a sample based producer for most of my adult life. With some of the first pieces of music I've ever produced or beats I ever made, were made possible by using samples. Whether it was chopping drum breaks for individual drum hits or recording random sounds around the house, pots and pans, birds chirping. One time I recorded a train to add to a song. Sampling has been very instrumental in my production life. And if you're also like me, at some point in your career, you've ran across the formerly trained naysayer musician who likes to downplay sampling. You know the saying, oh, you're just using someone else's idea as your own. That's not making music, like really. But you know, if you really break it down, the notion that sampling is not its own art form has long to be proven wrong given the decades long history we have with the art. And I know most people may think that sampling started in the 80s with hip hop and house music, but it actually goes back a lot further, all the way to the 1940s in fact. So let's take a look at some of these earlier examples of quote unquote sampling. French composer Pierre Schaeffer created Musée Concrete in the 1940s. Musée Concrete is an experimental form of music, sort of avant-garde, and it basically involves recording sound to tape, splicing it up, and manipulating them in different ways. Musée Concrete didn't make the leap into mainstream music until years later after it was introduced to the world particularly from a band that I'm sure you've heard of. Paul McCartney was the first member of the Beatles to actually introduce Musée Concrete. He encouraged the other members to start tinkering around with tape loops, and after lots of experimentation, the group got about 30 tape loops together that they wanted to use for Tomorrow Never Knows. So they go to George Martin with these 30 tape loops, which was obviously too much, and George Martin reduced those down to about 16 that were used in the actual part of the song. But they didn't stop there. One year later, John Lennon took the process even further with another classic. I Am The Rawless, particularly the ending, he actually recorded a part from an AM radio program that was doing a Shakespeare reading. And that's the part that you can hear on the fade out of the song that just sounds like somebody speaking. That was sampling. And the Beatles didn't stop there. One year later, John Lennon and Yoko Ono sought out to paint a revolution by way of sound. Now what the Beatles did with Musée Concrete was just scratching the surface. A few years later, the method was used by another band that I'm sure you've heard of. Money. The lead single from Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, and that was a great album. Now, Roger Waters created that loop himself using his Revox A77 audio recorder and recording sounds like coins clicking, paper tearing, and cash registers. He spliced that up music concrete style, and that ended up being the intro to one of the best rock songs in our history. Now, by this point in time, Using tape loops and music concrete methods were already pretty much well known to musicians. And an English musician by the name of Robert Fripp wanted to expand the process even further with his own style. I'm Robert Fripp and this is Frippatronics. Now, Frippertronics was more of like an earlier form of resampling and tape looping, more so than it was sampling as we know it today. So, the term sampling wasn't even coined 
until two Australian engineers by the name of Kim Ryrie and Peter Vogel created the Fairlight CMI and released it to the world in the late 1970s. The Fairlight Computer Musical Instrument. It's uh, $26,000 worth of electronic wizardry that's been developed over the last five years by Kim Ryrie and Peter Vogel. The Fairlight CMI started off trying to be the greatest synthesizer of realistic sounds. But they quickly realized that synthesizing realistic sounds wasn't the way to go. And it was much better to actually record sounds and play them back at different pitches. We're pouring water. Then we'll throw the spoon in. Stir it around a bit. And, and you can play those sounds like a piece of music. Right, they're pitched to the keyboard. By the late 70s, the Fairlight CMI was a hit. They were selling units to people like Stevie Wonder, Herbie Hancock, and their first purchaser happened to be Peter Gabriel. Gabriel was instantly enthralled by the unit and put it to immediate use. I think we did it. <laughs> oh, it looks good. The Fairlight CMI was a hit and it was definitely a product of its era. And like I said earlier, it introduced this new concept and term called sampling. Another band I'm sure you've heard of took advantage of the technology. What's attributed as the first drum break used in a commercially released song, Yes's Owner of a Lonely Heart actually contains a sample from the disco band Funk Incorporated. They took the sample, ran it through their Fairlight CMI, and put it in the intro and a breakdown of the song. And then the song became a hit. It should go without saying that the rise of music technology in the 80s led to the rise of sample-based music like hip hop and house. In fact, sampling became so ubiquitous that it allowed the DJ and the producer, some who might not have had formal musical training, to stand on the same pedestal as rock and R&B musicians, some who might have trained their entire lives to reach the heights that they reached. This juxtaposition led to a swarm of backlash against sampling. We've all heard the stories of hip hop producers in the 90s getting sued. And then there was lots of new laws put in place since then to protect the intellectual property of a musician. But none of that backlash has impeded the evolution of the art. There's all sorts of samplers and software that do sampling all around us today. So it's very clear that sampling is here to stay. So the next time you're with a musician who likes to down talk sampling as not being an original art, Maybe you should show them this video and try to change their perspective. But that's all I got for you today. I'm Fest Grandiose, signing off for Reverb. Stay safe and keep creating. Peace.